<laughs> We're very happy to see uh, a lot of students here from uh, Kelvin's engineering department and, and we're happy that you all could come out. Uh, the other co-sponsor, Sisland's Climate Lobby, uh, I just want to say a few words about. It's a national group that has one single purpose and that is to get a fee put on all carbon fuels, a rising fee over time. And the revenue that is so collected returned to the people as a monthly dividend check on an equal per capita basis. That's the whole spiel of Citizens Climate Lobby. It's a national organization, actually international. We have members uh, in uh, uh, Canada, China, Australia, uh, who knows where, but Africa. We have over 100,000 members, I believe. Started 11 years ago in California with a handful of people. Uh, we work with members of Congress, uh, lobby them. We're almost all volunteers. Grand Rapids chapter has no paid professional people. We're all volunteer people. And uh, um, so uh, we would invite you, we, well, we think, CCL thinks, that uh, the best way to get people to move away from using fossil fuels is to price them properly, to uh, uh, avoid the uh, pitfall of externalizing the social and environmental costs of using fossil fuels. And uh, eventually, as uh, the fee escalates, rises from year to year, uh, people will say, hey, I can do better things with my money. So we consider the fee and dividend proposal to be a, uh, a market-friendly proposal. We are not telling people what they have to do with their money. We're just telling people, when you use fossil fuels, we also have to price in the social and environmental costs associated with their use. And, uh, uh, and that will likely lead us to a clean energy transition. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, Mr. Alain Godot. He comes to us from France. Uh, he was born in France a few years ago, uh, immigrated to Canada, and uh, his entire working career was more or less in Canada. He has... Uh, he, he describes himself as a strategic planning expert. And, and he has consulted in over 30 countries during his uh, uh, career. Eastern Europe, African countries, Asian countries. Uh, he has been around. And a lot of his work has, has, been to, has had to do with the electric utility uh, business. And, uh, and that's really what he's going to talk about tonight. Uh, in Michigan right now, uh, the Michigan Public Service Commission, which is the body that regulates utilities, because utilities are more or less a, a monopoly in, in our state, uh, the NPSC is undergoing a review of how people who own solar panels or small businesses who own uh, wind farms or something, are reimbursed for the energy that they put on the grid. Right now, it's a net metering process, but with the new energy legislation in Michigan uh, last fall uh, or, or a year ago, uh, the net metering uh, process is going to be set aside and a new tariff structure is going to be imposed. And if that tariff structure is set improperly, it could really injure the, so, the clean energy business in Michigan. And that's what we're concerned about. Uh, there is an address on the uh, uh, sheet here. Uh, Julie Baldwin is uh, the uh, MPSC work group that is overseeing the process of establishing a new tariff for uh, this distributed generation. Uh, if you are interested in this issue and think that clean energy ought to be reimbursed properly and fairly 
and in a way that ensures that it does not collapse the clean energy business, you are invited to write some kind of letter expressing that opinion. And you could send it here uh, to this person. Uh, Elaine knows uh, Julie very well. He's presented to the MPSC this very seminar. Uh, and you're, you're going to get maybe a, a, a little shortened version of it tonight, but uh, we'll see how that goes. We're looking forward to this, Elaine, so uh, please welcome Elaine Goodman. Thank you, Ken. So now you know why I have, a, I have an accent. <laughs> Bear with me. Uh, the challenge that I have is that the electric power sector is pretty complex. It's a pretty sophisticated. I don't know if you have ever heard uh, the analogy about uh, what is complicated versus what is complex. Building a Boeing 747 is complicated, but it's relatively easy if you have the drawing. You know that you need to screw something here and put a cable there, and you could build one in your background. Uh, a plate of spaghetti is extremely complex. Because if you try to pull out one spaghetti, mm -hmm. everything moves and everything <laughs> changes. The electric sector uh, is uh, the same thing. So, why uh, we are, uh, first of all, why am I militating uh, with the CCL? It's because we have an unprecedented short term environmental challenge. This is pretty serious. It's caused by the CO2 and the pollution that comes from burning fossil fuels. And it's a vicious circle. Because you start putting CO2 in the atmosphere, then the consequence is the raising of the atmospheric and the sea temperature, which in turn accelerate in frequency and the amplitude of natural catastrophes. And uh, that in turn create disturbance of the ecosystem that in turn create even more CO2. So a few years ago, uh, uh, we could say that uh, the climate deterioration was coming mostly from us putting CO2 in the atmosphere. Now it's more than that. It's not only us, but it's the Earth itself that is reacting and adding more CO2. When you kill forest, when you have a floodings or things like that, it creates more decomposition of uh, organic matters and more CO2 in the atmosphere. So these are the catastrophes just this year that uh, we had in the US. Uh, I don't think uh, there is a need that almost everybody knows uh, what happened during the year. But the end result is the melting of uh, polar rocks. Uh, that has two <coughs> consequences. First of all, the raising of the sea level, the raising of the sea temperature too, and also the change in the color of the ground in the, in the two uh, poles, which uh, absorb more heat and then uh, contribute to further deterioration. Tornadoes, hurricane, they are there have always been tornadoes and hurricanes. But the problem we see now is that they are much more intense, much more frequent, <coughs> and much, much more destructive. Flooding, we have had quite a bit of that uh, during the year. And you can imagine what are the consequences of these, uh, these, uh, these things. Forest fire. So that was the last fire in California. And just that fire in California put into the atmosphere more CO2 than all the vehicles in, in, in North America. We cannot control that. So that's the reaction of the Earth itself that aggravates uh, the situation. Once you have had a forest fire, the ground <coughs> is unprotected. And when you have a big rain that follows a forest fire, you get that. You get mudslides and, and uh, uh, another round of <coughs> deterioration. You have drought. So this is a socialization of losses, because the combination of property damage and uh, uh, 
spending on aid uh, from uh, the U.S. this year was $306 billion. Last year, it was uh, $214 billion. And that does not include uh, the, the, the coverage from private insurance. It does not include still uh, human misery and the loss of life and the loss of property that is not even refunded by anybody. And this is all, all these costs are not accounted for in the cost uh, we pay for energy. <coughs> the problem that uh, we will face and that the utilities will face uh, pretty soon if we don't react is utility will be less focused pretty soon on providing reliable energy services and more on rebuilding power infrastructure which have been destroyed during this catastrophe, which is a good thing for them but not for us. Why I say it's a good thing for them, it's because they have a guaranteed return on their, their investment. So every time they put new investment to repair, destroy the infrastructure, they increase their revenue. So it's, a, it's another kind of vicious circle. We need to respond to be responsible for them. These are my, my grandchildren, <laughs> and, and this is for them that uh, I am doing that. And for you, of uh, your generation, it's uh, ourself we will see some of the results, but yourself, you are going to live with it, and even in uh, that generation, it could be a major problem. I don't want to see my grandchildren in a situation like that uh, pretty soon. So there is more and more Americans which are demanding action. As far as I'm concerned, not enough. <coughs> and one of the problems that we have is that there are many different groups that lobby about doing something, but it's very confused. It's not a, a single message that goes to the politician. If we could regroup all these groups and, and agree, on where the priorities are, that would be easier. Destabilizing strategy of deniers. You still have today some people that pretend that this is just bullshit. It does not exist. Uh, there is no global warming. And, and they are using exactly the same strategy that was used 20 years ago by the tobacco company. Oh, this is not really a problem. Uh, science do not, does not prove that people die from, from smoking. All, all, all these arguments, uh, they are repeated again and again today by the utility company. They finance think tank groups with similar agenda trying to deny that there is a problem. They are publishing studies specifically uh, to produce counter argument. Ecologists say things, then you have other scientific groups or, or scientists, usually they are individuals, uh, uh, putting forward counter-arguments. They hire scientists with unrelated expertise. They are high to spread doubts. There is one, I do not remember his name, but that's uh, very well known. He is talking, he is the chief denier from a scientific perspective. But he is a Nobel Prize. So he has credibility because of his Nobel Prize, except that he is a Nobel Prize in metallurgy. <laughs> so he knows very little about uh, climatic issues, and so but this is very targeted. We need a name that is well known, that has a diploma to speak in favor of what we do not want to see. They have strong public relations campaigns projecting a positive image while doing nothing significant. And this is certainly the case actually with utility company. It's also the case with the petroleum industry, fossil fuel uh, industry. They are presenting <coughs> alternative sets of data, alternative news if you will, and criticizing science-based uh, uh, methodologies. And they are financing politician and political campaign which support the denier's agenda, uh, which is a, a really a cancer at the political level. It's the, the money that more or less buy politicians 
uh, for them not to, uh, to have. This is not what will solve the problem. So what are we talking about uh, here? It's a major change of tiding in the overall energy ecosystem. Uh, I use energy ecosystem because it's more than electricity. It's also the transportation industry uh, that is included. Actually, this is where uh, the, the, the primary source of uh, energy used to produce electricity in Michigan. So you have the fossil fuel energy. That's, you see that uh, it's mostly coal, natural gas, and uh, more, uh, gasoline. Uh, this is for transportation uh, here at that level. And at the bottom, you have the clean renewable energy. There is very little uh, hydropower in Michigan, but there is quite a bit of nuclear electric power, except that these nuclear power plants are at the end of their life. What will happen in two or three years down the road when we are phasing out these uh, nuclear power plants? Then we are almost down to nothing. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Where am I? <laughs> Are you going ahead? Are you going ahead? No. Okay. okay. Right. <laughs> so uh, the clean, uh, the, what is in red is a nuclear. If that disappears, what we are left with is just that. Other renewable, this is insignificant. This is almost nothing. So that's uh, just to show the evolution over the past uh, five years. The coal went from 38% down to 31%, so we are phasing out coal power plants. It has been replaced by gas, which is cheaper actually and a little cleaner. And then the solar uh, went up pretty rapidly from, from uh, one tenth of a percent to almost one percent actually. This is the fastest uh, growing segment. And wind is also uh, doing pretty well. And there is much more wind energy than solar energy actually. So Another thing that you need to realize, this is the average price for residential customer in cents per kilowatt hour. This is at the, the, the US level. This is at the Michigan level. You see that the price of electricity in Michigan is much higher than it is uh, than the average uh, US, which means that in the US, you. Uh, some state uh, with even lower price uh, than that. The other thing that uh, you need to see on that graph is that <coughs> residential customers are subsidizing commercial and industrial. The price of energy per kilowatt at the industry level is much lower than at the residential level. I think there are some explanations for that. It's because usually industries are provided electricity at a much higher voltage uh, than uh, the residential. So there is less equipment in the distribution. But uh, between residential and commercial, there is no real justification for that, or very little. So what does that mean, the differential between the average national and Michigan? That represents $230 million over and above uh, the average US that we pay in Michigan uh, for uh, electricity. So the situation actually in Michigan is that uh, electricity plus heat, it's 57% of energy consumption. Coal is 23%, gas is 34%. Transportation <coughs> cars, it's at 21%. Biomass and others, uh, uh, other <coughs> in terms of fossil fuel energy, is 10.5%. On the clean energy side, 
you have nuclear, which is significant. But look at solar plus wind. This is where we stand, actually. So a lot of people are saying, no, we could be all uh, solar, or all wind, all clean energy. We are a long way uh, away from that, uh, actually. So that's the, uh, the effect on global warming and pollution in terms of intensity, uh, depending on the, the <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, if you look at uh, uh, coal, this is the most polluting. <coughs> Oil is almost not used anymore, uh, at least for, for uh, generating electricity. There, there are still some power plants which operate on oil. Natural gas is a little better. It's almost half the pollution effect uh, of coal. But it's still very far away from these clean energy uh, options here. <coughs> Actually, in Michigan, it's 11% uh, that is at that level that produce almost no CO2 and that is clean energy. But as I said, it's mostly due to nuclear. That represents 10% uh, of uh, uh, that 11%. Two or three years down the road, that would be gone, and uh, we will be left with almost nothing in terms of clean energy. So, shifting from uh, oil to gas, this is a significant improvement. So that's the, the move in the right direction, but we are still very far away from what could be achieved if we would increase <coughs> geothermal, wind, and uh, solar energy. So that's the next step. In terms of transportation, this is where the, uh, the, the volume is. It's light vehicles, they are cars mostly, and medium and heavy truck. Uh, uh, this is a uh, highway uh, type of vehicle. This is where the focus uh, uh, should be. This is the, the growth of electric vehicle in, the, in the, the US. So you see that there is a very significant increase. Uh, uh, only uh, 14 years ago, uh, we didn't have any electric <coughs> car. Actually, we are close to, uh, I, I think actually it's around 800,000. And uh, that will continue uh, increasing. So that's. The, uh, in, in terms of uh, cars, and uh, uh, this is the, uh, the range uh, of uh, vehicle. So gasoline uh, vehicles are still uh, better. Uh, they are at 418 miles uh, per equivalent uh, gallon. The electric car are at that level. The medium is at 114. These are the Tesla cars. And uh, actually, uh, uh, this is planned to increase. So that's the, uh, the forecast for uh, electric vehicle. The reason wh why I'm talking about electric vehicle is because if we move from fossil fuel vehicle to electric uh, car, we move the demand uh, uh, to the electric utility company. And we will see why <coughs> this is very important later on. Uh, there, there is a, a, actually a huge amount of investment from most of the uh, car manufacturers uh, to develop electric car and uh, uh, new batteries. It's uh, currently planned that in 2030 there will be 15 to 20 percent of new vehicles in the US, U.S. will be electric car. Investment in electrified vehicles currently today includes 19 billion dollars for automakers in the United States, 21 billion dollars in China, and 52 billion dollars in Germany. And why that in Germany? It's because both Audi. Volkswagen, BMW are all committed 
215 uh, earlier car. Mercedes-Benz, for example, uh, uh, is investing 11.712 million billion to produce 10 pure electric models and 40 hybrid models. And it intends to electrify its full range of vehicles from mini compact commuters to heavy duty trucks. So the trend is there. Most of the manufacturers are moving toward electric cars. But we could ask what is it worth moving from fossil fuel to electric, uh, to electricity, if electricity is still produced with dirty fuel? It is still. It, it is nevertheless an improvement uh, because the efficiency, the thermal efficiency of an electric car is much better than uh, the thermal efficiency of a, a fossil fuel uh, car. Actually, Detroit is even uh, moving. Uh, I was in Detroit uh, during the weekend and I saw one of, uh, this is not in Detroit, but this is in New York, but they have exactly the same thing. The, the city buses uh, are moving to electric and they recharge their battery every time they stop at the station. They have a kind of a photograph, I don't know what you call it, and they can uh, recharge it uh, uh, at that level. There is a, a very long way to go. To secure our survival, we have to analyze the past, understand the problem that we have created in the past, consider where we stand actually presently and visualize the future. The biggest problem is that there is very low visualization at the political level and even at the level of the uh, regulators. We need to take greater risk. Now is the time to be more innovative than ever and try new approaches to depart from the polluting past. New ideas and innovation must be given a chance and time to succeed. So the focus of the presentation uh, will be mostly generation and distribution of electric energy with in the background understanding that there will be an, a huge increase in demand for electricity that will come from the shift from fossil fuel car to electrical car. So that's, uh, these are the statistics for consumer energy. So we are going to focus <coughs> mostly on residential and commercial. Uh, so that represents, just for consumer energy, that represents 69% uh, of the customers and uh, uh, almost a $3 billion of uh, uh, earnings. This is at that level uh, that you can have distributed generators or distributed uh, energy resources that I will explain later on. So what is a distributed generator customer? You have solar panel on the roof or in your garden or around the house, and you have a dumb <laughs> inverter. That means the purpose of the, that, that inverter is just to convert DC current that is produced by the solar panel into alternative current uh, that you need uh, to uh, feed your appliances in the house. Then, when there is not enough, when, when there is sun, and if there is enough sun, and if you have enough solar panel, all that energy goes uh, to meet the load in your house. But if there is no sun, or at night, you need energy because the load is, is still there at the level of your house, so you get it, you borrow it, or you buy it more uh, from uh, the grid. And then, if you have surplus of energy, let's say that it's a very sunny day, you have plenty of solar panel here, but you do not use, uh, you, you do not have a use, an immediate use for the electricity. Since you cannot store the energy, the only alternative that you have is to return it to the grid. So the grid is useful for you because not only it provides you inflows of energy when you need it, but when you do not is built to you 
at an average retail price. I will cover that later on. If you had an electric car, or two electric cars, uh, uh, most uh, uh, you will not be able uh, to uh, charge the battery uh, with your solar panel because uh, the, the battery size on a, in an electric car is much bigger than what you can uh, generate, self-generate. So the electricity will come from the enclosed and uh, to charge the, the car. Now, where do we stand actually in terms, this is the, the, the drop in the cost of solar panel. Actually, we are here at that level where the red line is. I am always pressing the wrong button. <laughs> so it, it is, there is still room for improvement here. Actually, we are almost at the level of $3 uh, per kilowatt, per watt, sorry, uh, uh, of uh, 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 DC uh, solar panel, and it is expected that that will go down to $2. Uh, dollar. For uh, uh, utilities, uh, they actually they are almost at half that, they are at uh, one, uh, one dollar uh, per uh, one. So one of the arguments uh, that the utilities are using is say, why should we install solar panel on customer's house? It's cheaper to install them uh, uh, to, to build utility size uh, uh, solar farm. There is some truth to that, but I will show you later on that this is a false argument. What are the claims made by the utilities? By the way, the claims made by the utilities, they are made through the back door. They meet with the regulator and they tell the regulator, this is what we want, this is what we do not want, don't try to get something that we do not want, this is behind doors. The presentation that we have made uh, ourselves to the utility, to the, uh, the commission, uh, were just users. And users are not customers, are not organized to make an articulate presentation to the regulator. It comes with all sorts of arguments. Some of them are technically solid, but most of them are not technically solid. So it's, uh, it's more to please the crowd, if you wish. But the real discussion of that goal. So one argument that the utilities are using, they say that distributed generators are eroding their revenue stream. This is true. Because a, a, a customer used to buy 100% of their electricity from the grid. Now they have solar panel, so they buy 50% or 20% or or 10% of what they use to buy. So that reduced uh, the uh, revenue stream from the utilities. Distributed generators are causing an increase of stranded generation assets. This is also true. And uh, I will cover that uh, later on in, in greater detail. Distributed generators are not paying their fair share of distributed network, distribution network. This is not true. And uh, this is mostly the reason why they are asking the regulator to kill, kill net metering and replace it by a new, they say, fair tariff to compensate uh, the distributed generators uh, for, for their energy. So the, the real intention is, is they are using arguments, if you wish, to the regulator saying, we should not, I think I have another slide, this one. what they want. They want a lower rate for the outflow. So they want to build the inflow of energy delivered to the customer at the retail price, but they don't want to buy the energy, the surplus energy at the same price. So in other words, they want to make a profit on the outflow. And the outflow of energy goes directly to your neighbor, next, uh, next door house, and the next door uh, customer 
uh, get that and it goes through their meter and they are charged the full retail price for the electricity that includes some energy that comes from your house. Same thing for the transmission, uh, uh, the distribution cost. So that's typical, actually, the Edison Electrical Institute, it's an institute that represents uh, uh, utilities. So they are framing, they are currently framing uh, distributed generators, saying that net metering is a hidden subsidy. And that DG, uh, the distributed generator or distributed energy resources, are freeloaders. That they benefit from the grid for free, rather than portraying them as environmentally uh, responsible customers. So that's a very uh, vicious argument that need uh, to be counteracted. Uh, they also want to collect distribution charge on outputs. I will cover that later on. They want to limit the solar capacity of DGs and the lab. That means they are willing to tolerate that you put some solar panel on your house, but not too much. It has, it, it's capped. So why they, they want that? It's because they consider people who put solar panel on, on, the, on their roof as a competitor that affect their bottom line. And they do not want to talk about distributed energy resources. And this is, uh, as I will demonstrate later on, this is really, really where the benefits are. So, and they want to delay reforms of net credit. Let's say that you have returned quite a bit of energy uh, to, to the grid. So you, are, you own a credit from them. And if the credit is higher than the amount of energy that you have bought from the grid, they keep it on their side, they, they move it forward, but they do not want to refund you unless if you get off the distributed generators uh, uh, program. Some of these positions have the potential for a class action lawsuit. So we will see what the regulator decide to do. So how does that work? You have a separation between the grid on the top and the uh, distributed generator at the bottom. To be authorized to connect your installation to the grid, you have to meet some mandatory technical prerequisites, which is quite normal. They cannot uh, allow uh, anybody to connect to the grid if that disturbs the grid and if the grid is not uh, uh, reliable anymore. But providing that you meet the technical prerequisite, uh, uh, then you can do whatever you want on your side. They will keep. So you, you have a customer load. Uh, this is your electrical panel in your basement. You self-generate energy. If it's sunny outside, you may have enough energy to meet the demand here. But <coughs> certainly not at night when there is no sun, and certainly not when it's raining outside, or even at some point if there is a cloud that uh, brings shades on, on your solar panel, you will not be able to meet the demand here. So, so the dumb inverter that I just mentioned earlier is just to modify to, to transfer the DC current into alternative current at that level. So if there is not enough self-generation at some point, you have to get it from uh, the grid. So this is what we call the inflow. Since you do not have any battery, you cannot store energy. So it's constantly fluctuating depending on how the, 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 the customer load fluctuates in your house. If, if the, the water pump starts, you need more energy. But if you cannot <coughs> generate enough from that, you need some inflow uh, uh, to feed uh, the pump. 
but maybe a, a couple of seconds later on, the pump is off. Now you may have more energy, self-generation energy. There is no demand in, in the house, so you return it uh, uh, to the grid. So this is done in real time. So you sell uh, the, the surplus uh, of energy in real time. The problem that we are discussing actually with the regulator is how should we oh. <laughs> So the, uh, if the grid is down, there is no inflow, but you cannot return outflow uh, to the grid, so you are stuck uh, with the self-generation here that you need to consume inside uh, of the house. The reason why the, your house is disconnected when the grid is down, it's because they do not want to see energy going back to the grid. If they do maintenance on the grid, that would be dangerous for the people doing the maintenance on the grid. So your house is uh, uh, island. Okay, so this is the way the energy could be built. Uh, I don't know if you, you are all aware of that, but you should look at uh, your, your bill uh, from the utility. You are billed for a first component, which is the cost of the energy that you buy. A second component is the cost of distributing the energy through the grid. And uh, there are other uh, components. By the way, there is a system access charge and since I worked uh, on that, I looked at my own bill and I realized that for 14 years <laughs> I had been, been billed a system access charge of $20 instead of $7. <laughs> so uh, I, I called the company and I said, this is not normal. Uh, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and uh, it might be an error. If it's an error, that's okay. But if several of you are billed at $20 for access charge, that's a fraud. It's different. Okay, so the, uh, under net metering, uh, you get, you are billed with an average cost of service. That means the way it works is the utility compiles all, all, all of its costs to produce energy and then distribute <coughs> that uh, to the different uh, customer classes and uh, define a charge, an average price per kilowatt. So it's pretty straightforward. It's the average cost of service rate per kilowatt multiplied by the quantity of kilowatt. Now, under the new proposal that uh, the uh, Commission wants to put in force, you would be built exactly the same way for the inflows. And this is normal and this is important because they don't want to make any differentiation between people having uh, a solar panel on their roof and those who do not have uh, a solar panel. Because if they make a difference between the two four inflows, I mean, for the energy that you draw uh, from, from the grid, if they, they, there would be a difference, then the regular customer would say this is not fair because you are subsidizing uh, the people who have solar panel. So for inflow, it would be exactly the same thing as a normal customer. The problem <coughs> that we face actually is that the Commission is proposing to use what we call a per part rate. This is technical at that level, but let me try to summarize. The average cost of service rate is based on the current power plant and the current distribution system, the current operating condition uh, of the grid as it is today. The pure per rate is a theoretical rate that is based on a future power plant that will be built in the future and that is expected to be more efficient than the current power plants which are in operation. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they say, we are going to bill you for the inflow at a higher rate, but we are going to buy the energy from you 
at a lower rate that is based on what will happen in the future with a, a modern uh, power plant. This is not fair. Mm -hmm. So, what uh, uh, we have said, we cannot accept that. It should be the average cost of service weight uh, per kilowatt hour for the outflows of a kilowatt hour. So then you would be very close to the same thing as here. The, the differential is approximately 30% uh, uh, between uh, the uh, pure power rate and the average uh, uh, cost. So that represents, for an average customer, uh, $350 per, per year uh, uh, detrimental. So actually, if you have solar panel on your roof, and if the proposal from the Commission is passed, then you would get $350 less than you used to have when you were built uh, on the net monitoring. That would kill the, the, uh, the solar panel uh, industry, at least at the, the, the residential and commercial level. So for the distribution charge, how that works? Actually, a traditional power distribution system, you have power plants at the bottom. Then you have the transmission system. Then you have the distribution uh, feeders. And then you have the customers at the, at the periphery of, of that. So actually, it's a one-way road. The electricity comes from here, go through the whole transmission, the whole distribution, and uh, to reach the, uh, the customer at the periphery. When we are talking about distributed generator or distributed energy resources, they, they are there. So they produce energy at that level, at the, the periphery of the grid. And uh, when they have a surplus, they send back the energy to the grid. So now we are moving from a unidirectional system to a bidirectional system where energy goes on and off. And that's a, a quite a difference from an operating uh, perspective. Actually, the full cost of service of transmission and distribution is charged to the customer proportionally to the amount of inflows of energy. That means that somebody, even if he has a solar panel here, every time he, he buys energy from the grid, he is charged from the cost of the distribution system. So, when the, the utilities say, Yes, but these guys are, are, are not paying their fair share uh, of, uh, of the transmission and distribution charges. This is not really true because you pay proportionally to the number of kilowatt -er. You used to be consuming more kilowatt -er than you do now that you have uh, the solar panel. But for what you get from the grid, you pay the full uh, cost of uh, transmission and distribution. So that's the core of one argument here. There is a double accounting of distribution charge for outflows. So you have a distributed generator. He has solar panel. So he self-generated energy. When there is not enough energy, he buy energy from the grid. So these are the inflows. And that includes the distribution charge. Now, if I have surplus of energy, the surplus of energy do not go back <coughs> through the whole distribution and transmission system. It's immediately absorbed locally by your neighbors. So <coughs> that means your neighbors, these are the meter from, 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 from the neighbor. So they are charged from the energy that they get from the grid. Mm -hmm. and they are also charged for the amount of energy that you have returned uh, uh, to the grid. But they pay the full retail price, both for energy and uh, uh, distribution uh, charge. So the distribution charge are, are, are billed twice, because you have already paid for the distribution charge here, 
you return some energy here, and it's recharged again at full rate uh, by the utility company. Uh, uh, this is, again, not fair for both distribution charge and uh, energy charge. So one of the big problems that uh, the, uh, the utilities uh, are complaining about is what we call the duck curve effect. Uh, if this is the consolidated uh, demand for, from all of the customers that the utility need uh, to meet. People who have solar energy on a sunny day they produce energy uh, roughly between 10 o'clock and, uh, and 5, 6 o'clock there. So uh, actually this is a big jump of, uh, uh, of, uh, of energy, of uh, clean energy. In Michigan it would be just a little <laughs> bit at uh, yeah. uh, uh, that level. But what, what is the impact of that? That means that before we had the solar panel on the, on the roof, the utility had to meet that demand. Actually, what they need to meet is that one. Because that portion here was produced at the periphery of the grid uh, by the solar panel. What are the consequences for that? Is the way utilities operate, it's called uh, a merit order. So you start getting, you start producing electricity from the lowest cost power plant. They are called base power plants. Usually they are coal power plants or nuclear and more and more gas. Then you have to meet the demand here, so you start a smaller power plant <coughs> you meet the demand there. Then you have to stop it, then you have to restart it to meet the demand later on during the day. And you do that several times. And why it is uh, called uh, the dot curve, it's because that's the tail of the dot, and that's the back, and that's the, the, the head of the dot. But the consequences is that you have to stop and stop power plants regularly. And the deeper, the more solar energy you produce, the more disturbing it is on the grid. Because first of all, that part here is what we call the spinning reserve. So you cannot produce electricity instantly from a power plant. You have to start it in advance to build it up in temperature so that there is no thermal shock uh, on the equipment. But during, in, in, uh, in that section, the power plant is running, you consume fuel or gas, but you do not produce any <coughs> electricity. And since you produce electricity only during a short period of time, the cost per kilowatt is much higher than it is with a, a, a base power plant. And at, at that level, it's even uh, worse. This is what we call the picker plant. They are operated only a few hours per day, uh, and not even per day, some days. Uh, uh, depending on the season, uh, uh, some of them are operated a few hours per year. So the cost of producing electricity at that level is very high. So now we move from a distributed generator who has only solar panel, we move to what we call a distributed energy resource customer. And this is really where the benefits are. Instead of having a dumb investor, uh, inverter, you have a smart inverter. You still have the load for the house. You have solar panel. You are still connected to the grid. So <coughs> up to that level, the only difference is the smart instead of dumb uh, inverter. Now you had the battery inside of your house. So when 
your solar panel produce more energy than you need for the house, instead of returning it to the grid, you store it. And you store it to be able to use it later on for your own purpose, or if you have enough battery storage, to sell it back to the grid at a specific time of the day, which is at the top, at the peak, during the peak period. Then you have an electric car. Usually, most of the in-house battery uh, storage are 14 kilowatt -er. The battery in a car is uh, uh, now more and more up to 100 uh, kilowatt -er. So, with the electricity that you have in the, 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 the car battery, uh, if you do not use the car, you can meet the customer load for three or four days uh, with that. So you have plenty of energy if you can use it. So if, when you go back from the office, there is energy that is left into your car battery, you can use it back and return it during the peak time to the grid. Then you have uh, telecommunication and the uh, utility send the rate schedule and I will come back on the, the rate schedule later on to telecommunication and it is stored into the smart inverter. And the smart inverter is the brain. It's the brain that knows, depending on how much the electricity costs on the grid, at what price I can return it uh, to the grid, how much in, uh, the capacity of my battery, how much uh, energy I have stored in my battery. We optimize the flow of energy between all of these sources to maximize uh, the, revenue, the revenue that you can uh, get uh, from the grid. Then you can also, if you have enough storage capacity inside of the house, you can, most of the, the, the smart inverters can accept signals from the grid that when the grid is in distress, when the voltage drop, when the frequency shift, when there are problems on the grid, it sends a message to the inverter and the inverter can call in some energy that you have in the battery and provide the grid with what we call ancillary services. So in other words, automatically the smart inverter can stabilize the grid at the periphery of the grid. That has a value. If you provide such services to the grid, you should pay, uh, uh, be paid for it. Another possibility is the dispatch of the surplus stored energy See, during the peak time. So they, this is what, uh, uh, at that level, there is uh, what we call a, a, a distribution system operator at the utility company that instead of dispatching the peaker power plant that is far away and having to transfer all the energy through the transmission and distribution system, he can dispatch the energy that you have in your battery or in your electric car to provide peak energy to the grid. And peak energy is sometimes, depending on the period of the year, can be two, three, four, up to 10 times the price of the, uh, the, 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 the regular energy. So if my smart inverter is smart enough, now it, it will try to get revenue from all of these uh, different sources and then that will pay for my, uh, my installation. I, I don't think I should cover that. Uh, that's in, in, a, in an electric car, you have the motor and you have an inverter. So that means that you have a smart inverter in the car too. So instead of moving the electricity from the car battery through your inverter to the grid, you could go and use the inverter that is in the car. So that will double the amount, the flow of energy that you can return uh, to the grid uh, at peak time, which increased again the, the, the value. Car manufacturer, are not willing to to see uh, to see that link here. 
they say the car is a car, the car is designed to run on the road, and the car is not designed to uh, provide you with revenue <laughs> uh, <laughs> from energy that you return to the grid. And the main reason why they say that is because there is a warranty on the, on the batteries, and a lot of regulators are wanting to use the energy that is in electric car, electric buses, electric trucks, and uh, uh, to return it to the grid and support the grid uh, when the grid is displaced. So this is how a smart inverter look like. This is not a Tesla, this is a Pika. And this is how an in-house uh, battery storage uh, look like. So it's very neat, it's clean. You don't touch it, you cannot open it. All the, the logistic, the brain is inside. You have no access to it except that you can program it here whatever you want the smart inverter to do. If you want to maximize your security in house, you can do it. If you want to maximize the revenue that you will get from the grid, you can do it. So how that work, the brain inside of the smart inverter, <coughs> it follow up on the load, the demand from your house. So this is your demand of energy. It knows when you generate solar energy, so it, it, it can meter the amount of energy that is generated from your solar panel. It monitors the amount of energy that you have stored into your battery, in-house battery. And it manages the, the inflow from the grid. When there is not enough energy generated here to meet that, we call energy either from the battery or from the grid. It optimizes that. Then it uh, receives a weather forecast. So if I know that tomorrow will be a sunny day, and that I will generate a lot of energy, I will try to empty my battery totally uh, at night so that I have plenty of storage to keep all the energy that will be generated by my solar. So again, this is part of the optimization inside. Then it receives from the grid the, what we call the time of use rates. I will cover that soon. It receives signal from the grid sensors. And it receives energy dispatch order from the distribution system operator. So a customer could decide to always keep a backup reserve in his battery in case the, uh, the distribution network goes down. So if it goes down, I will still have enough energy uh, to meet some of the load inside of my house. If my uh, smart inverter is smart enough, he will know statistically how much energy I need during the peak time. So during the peak time, I will not buy energy from the grid. I will get it from my battery, which is the energy that I produce myself, or that I bought from the grid at low cost during of peak period. And if there is still some energy left during the peak time, I return it only uh, uh, during the peak time at a high cost uh, uh, to the grid. So, uh, in other words, I have purchased energy to fill in my battery off peak at low cost, and I am returning energy at high price during the, the peak uh, period. So, again, that's the way it works. You have the forecast, the weather forecast, that are all represent the brain of, uh, of uh, your smart inverter. You have on-site energy storage. You self-generate, you put it into your energy storage systematically the same way as a, as a, 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 a computer. Uh, you, when you, you, you plug it uh, in, in the wall, the, uh, the electricity from the grid get into your battery and your computer is operated from the battery. Same thing for a, uh, for a hybrid car. 
and uh, you meet uh, the domain for the house. And oh, what did I do? Yeah. Okay. So uh, you can decide uh, to have a backup. This is a security, and you are the one to decide. I, I want a small backup, or I want a very. If my wife is naturally anxious, uh, I will get a higher backup uh, to satisfy her. Uh, but I would lose money. In that case. And uh, uh, if if I, I hear on the radio that there will be a danger for a tornado or a cyclone or or, or major wind. Well, the day before, I will increase the backup uh, uh, reserve in my battery in case. If it's uh, going to be sunny, well, I will reduce that amount so that I have more energy to uh, return to the grid. So inside of the house, usually most people uh, would do, they duplicate their, their, their uh, what is the name for the, the, the panel? Yes. With the, the electric panel with all the switch in the basement. Mm -hmm. and, and they put some load as covered by backup. So that means that if the grid gets down, the, the energy here will fit only what is essential in the house and will <coughs> not fit fill the, uh, the non backup. Critical load panel. Critical load, yeah. Okay, so now this is where it becomes interesting. <laughs> The outflow, since you have a battery here inside of the house, you should make the maximum, the optimum use of that, the, the, the battery storage that you have inside of the house. And the optimum use will be to buy energy here at low cost during the off-peak time to load your battery up to a maximum. And just before you shift to the high, the peak period, then your battery is full, and then you maximize what you can return uh, uh, to the grid. Instinctively, uh, instinctively uh, utilities do not like that. <laughs> Why the hell should we allow you to buy energy cheap and sell it back to us at a higher price? Except that what they forget it is that you have invested in those equipments here. And the differential in price between the inflow and outflow, this is what will amortize the equipment that you have installed here. Then, as I said, if you receive input from the grid sensors, you can provide the grid with what we call ancillary services to adjust the uh, uh, frequency and, and voltage and stabilize the grid in the area around, around your house. That should be remunerated, and nobody knows at what value <laughs> for the time being. So there is some experimentation to be done at that level. From a utility point of view, they say, yes, if you provide ancillary services which are reliable, then we might be willing to pay for it. So the, the question of reliability is important. So it depends on the quality of your smart inverters and the characteristic of your battery. <coughs> the, 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 the DSO, its distribution system operator, can dispatch the surplus of energy that you have in your battery during the peak time. We will see that uh, uh, later on. The other potential benefits that you can get uh, from the system is a locational premium. Because, oh, how the hell am I going to explain that? <laughs> uh, it depends on where you live. If you live in an area where the distribution system is congested at peak time, that means that it's saturated and it's dangerous, it could trip at any time. If you allow distributed energy customers on the feeders in the congested area, that will release the congestions from the feeder and so that you will delay 
a new investment to upgrade the distribution grid. So I don't know if you understand that. Uh, I'm perhaps getting a, a little bit too technical there. Uh, value of renewable energy certificates. Uh, there are some people who install solar panels uh, uh, here in the assembly. Uh, when you have solar panel, you are entitled to receive what is called energy renewable certificate. Actually, there is no market for that. So you, you buy them, uh, but you do not sell them. But eventually, that's something that can be sold. Uh, uh, in Europe, uh, there is a market for renewable energy certificates. <coughs> You can get utility provided subsidized financing. If I am a utility, I know that uh, in an area of Grand Rapids, I have congestion. I want to attract customers to become distributed energy customers. Put solar panel on their roof, put batteries in their house, because that will allow me to delay costly investment to upgrade the distribution system. So the utility company might say it's cheaper for me to subsidize a customer to install battery in their house rather than spending a lot of money upgrading the distribution system. Federal and state subsidy. And the benefit of in-house backup energy uh, there, there, there is a benefit attached to that. Uh, some people install a, a diesel generator outside of their house or a gas uh, generator outside of their house. It costs five to ten thousand dollars. Uh, there is a cost to that. That increases the security inside of the house. Too. Okay, so that's that will probably clarify some of the things that I already said. The difficulty that I had in preparing that. Uh, that slide presentation was to decide which slide should go up front. And, and so that this is the merit order dispatching of generation. This is what the utility has to meet in terms of demand, of load. They dispatch power plants by merit order. So that means that they stop by dispatching the load <coughs> of power plants and then progressively they dispatch power plants that cost more to produce energy. So this is what we call the merit order. One of the reasons why these power plants cost much more is because they are operated in a very short period of time. They cost the same amount of money to build, or almost the same amount of uh, investment than any other power plant, but they are run on a short period of time. So that increased the cost per kilowatt. As I, I told, this is what we call the spinning reserve. So I have to stop these units well in advance, sometimes several hours in advance, to warm up the equipment so that when I need to meet that demand, the equipment is warm and I can generate electricity uh, right away. So to have what, what I explained worked well. You need a different pricing mechanism. You need to, to send strong price signal. So how this is done, <coughs> we, we incentivize customers to modify and optimize their load uh, profile. This uh, was the rationale used by the utility several years ago to justify <coughs> installing uh, smart meters. Most of your houses <coughs> have smart meters, but they are not used in smart meters. Uh, so the, the investment has been made. The investment was good for the utilities because it increased their capital uh, investment. So they get a 10% return uh, on that investment, but it's not used. So we have to move from an average rate to what we call a time of use rate for the energy. So the way it is done, the, the day is split into uh, 20, uh, 20 hour increments. You have low rate during a certain period of time during the day, and usually the lowest cost are the base uh, power plant. 
then you have what we call medium rates during a, a period. This is uh, uh, produced by intermediate uh, trend. And then you have higher rates during the peak period. So the way it works is you measure the amount of kilowatt within one hour increment. And you multiply it by the rate that gives you a cost <coughs> of energy for that increment of time. And you do that for every hour increment. So you get the cost of energy that you have bought, but you bought it at different price at the, a different period of the day. So it provides a clear and powerful price signal to the customers. What it says is, buy energy at low cost. If you have a battery, you can do that. If you do not have a battery in your house, you cannot do that. You cannot buy it cheap. You store it when not required to meet your load inside of the house. You use it at high cost peak times. So that means that instead of buying electricity at high rate during that period, I use electricity that I bought at low cost uh, uh, during the night or during the, the off peak period. And if I have a surplus, I return the excess to the grid at peak time at a higher price. Because the energy that I return is a return at that price, but I bought it at that price. So the differential <coughs> between the two help me uh, uh, amortize the equipment that I've installed uh, in the house. Uh, I think uh, you, you are probably getting saturated now. Eh? <laughs> we should finish soon, though. Yeah, okay. It's 8.20. Okay, yeah, I think we should finish. So, let's go. <laughs> the, 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 the purpose of that slide, which is something that is not done today, is actually they, 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 they build the commercial people and the residential people based on the time of use. Uh, rate that is the same for both of them. But the peak period for commercial is during the day. <coughs> Here, when the stores are open, and the peak period for residential customer is between 5 and 10 or 11 at that time. So we should have different rates for commercial <coughs> and residential, which is not the, the case actually. Okay, I will uh, pass that. Uh, uh, ju just for your information, for Michigan, the current effective use of generation and distribution infrastructure is 45%. Mm -hmm. That means that we pay for 100% of this infrastructure, but the effective average rate is 45%. So that means that we, we pay 65% uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of infrastructure, which are used a few times during the year. So that's, that, that will explain, so I, will, I, I think I will finish it. What, instead of having that demand curve, actually, what would happen if we could flatten that curve? And this is the whole purpose of distributed energy. So I would run my uh, core uh, low-cost power plant, and now, I am capable of operating intermediate power plant on a 24-hour basis up to that level, instead of only during that period. So that reduces the cost of electricity produced there. And every customer in Michigan would benefit from that saving. So that, this is the, the amount of energy that I bought in surplus of what I need. The, the need was there. But during the night, I bought more energy, and I stored it into the battery. So this is stored into the battery in the house. And at time, at night, during the peak time, I unload the amount of energy that is in the battery, and I used it as a virtual power plant to replace a peaker plant. So what is the result? I have reduced the cost of per kilowatt -er. I have freed up some power generation capacity that is not required anymore. 
because it's uh, it's above uh, uh, the, uh, the the load demand the flattened load demand curve, and I could use those power plants to replace dirty uh, 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 coal uh, power plants uh, at the bottom. So this is a system that is much more efficient in terms of cost of water and in terms of declaring some uh, power plants stranded. So obviously the utilities say, yes, that's fine, but who is going to pay for the stranded power plants? Because they are built, we know, so, yes, so they need to be built. And that's an argument that they have, except that you have the growth of electric vehicles. So electric vehicle will increase the demand on the utility and will allow them <coughs> to reuse some of the stranded power plants uh, later on. So if they look at it from a warrior perspective, uh, uh, they are not going to lose or not, not a lot. The, the other thing uh, uh, that needs to be understood is that the people who install solar panels in their house are the most likely one to shift to an electric car too. So by shifting to an electric car, they are going to buy more electricity rather than less uh, from the utility. Okay, so that's the end. The solution, the, the, the economy, the combination of solar panels plus smart inverter plus battery in the house, plus a hooked up electric car, if, if you have one, plus strong price signal in terms of time of use, this is what creates the optimal benefit. So this is it, uh, I think uh, that's the end. So very often uh, people say, uh, why should we bother with the small capacity uh, customers? It's small capacity at the, at the house level, but it's a very high number of customers. We need to have bigger <coughs> customers here. Uh, uh, not all of them uh, will become distributed generators, but even if it's 10% uh, of them, that's a huge impact. And it's the same thing here. It's a, a slightly higher capacity, medium number, or utility size capacity with a low number. All of that will be an impact, and they are not mutually exclusive. You can play at all level. However, the key thing here is that positive response to price signal is much greater at the customer level. So this is when you can convince customers at the periphery of the grid to manage their load, to shift their load. This is where the greatest impact is. Okay. Okay. Uh, some people probably have to leave. Thank you, students. Have you all got your forms that you need to fill out? Yeah. Uh, I think we'll take a few minutes. We have this room till 9 p.m. So we can stick around and ask.